Jesse Owens. Carl Lewis had established himself as a legend in his own right. Despite the presidential reception and subsequent celebrations, it soon became apparent that Lewis was not to everyone's liking. To some, he was every inch the modern superstar athlete, flashy, aloof, arrogant. I would say, you know, as far as the spotlight, yes, we were definitely at many times uh, in his shadow as far as that goes. I think that uh, one can be a, um, you know, good runner, great runner and, you know, world class and all of that. But I think that attitude and demeanor plays a big part. And I think, no, I'm, I'm going to put that I know from what has been on a number of teams with Carr that he was not a team player. I can't escape it. Every time I turn around, I find you there. Yet those who Just knew Carl Lewis best recognized he was pushing yeah. the boundaries of track and field in the mid 80s. He was attempting to professionalize and glamorize what was still largely an amateur sport. When he came here as a freshman, I was sitting in my office doing some work and he walked into my office and he said, Coach, I don't want to work. I want to be rich running. I want to be rich and I want to make it running. So his mind was on professionalism in track and field. I mean, you can't help but, be, but separate yourself from the group of sprinters when you're, when you're the best guy. I think the real issue was Carl was so radical and outside the, the norm that uh, some of the media just didn't know, quite know how to, how to handle it. Supply and demand, you know, and he was worth money and he asked for it. And if he didn't get it, he'd go home, but he got it. And so that raised the level for every track and field runner at that time. And by Carl pushing those doors open, he allowed other athletes to come through that door without the struggle, and the struggle that we had leading up until the 80s. And a lot of people may say arrogance, or self-centered, but Carr knew what he wanted. But love him or loathe him, the sport yeah. couldn't live without him. He brought a new level of tactical awareness to the sprint events. Lewis ran his races in 10 meter phases, calculating every step in order to be the fastest man on the planet. Carl really got people to look at the sprints a little bit more uh, in a different light, uh, along with, with uh, Coach Telez, our coach. Before Carl, everyone thought, you get a great start, you run it as hard as you could, and, and cross the line, that guy's gonna be the winner. And Carl changed the, race to, changed the race a little bit, at least 100. But just as Lewis looked to be untouchable, one man emerged to threaten his place as the world's best. Canadian athlete Ben Johnson was beginning to run very fast. So fast, but even Lewis couldn't catch him. No one could. When Ben Johnson started getting great, then I started to think, wait a second, how can this guy be that great all of a sudden? The way that um, he would hop out of the blocks and just go and leave everyone, <laughs> just, just basically what he did, <laughs> um, you know, uh, was like, wow, you know, this is incredible. Taking Lewis's 100-meter title in the 1987 World Championships proved that Johnson could do it on the big occasion. It was the first major sprint final Lewis had lost. But publicly, his camp remained unfazed. First of all, you have to understand a, a little bit about what our philosophy was on training, is that the Olympic Games was the number one goal. And so, at the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, all eyes were on two athletes in the race to become the fastest man on earth, Johnson versus Lewis. And what happened in that 100 meter final would shock the world. That was the first time Carl really went into a race thinking, I don't know if I can win this race or not. I was, you know, watching the race from the stands and, and you know, they line up and boom, the gun goes off. Man, as soon as the gun went off, Ben had everybody by four or five meters. And Ben, uh, it was like unreal. Boom, he was, he was flying. And then Carl, instead of running his own race, looked over and looked at Ben Johnson. And when you do that, you're, you're not really running. And then he went again. 
And then he looked again at him. He looked twice at him. Maybe three times he looked at Ben Johnson instead of running his own race. If he had run his own race, I think he'd have been there at the end because I don't think Ben Johnson was that great of a sprinter. It was a blistering run from Johnson. A new world record of 9.79. It left everyone wondering how he could run so much faster than anyone else. That race was shocking. Um, I just don't know how he does it or whether he, he, he gets a hypnotist or something, but he does something to um, stimulate him in the finals. It soon became very clear just how Ben Johnson did it. The urine sample of Ben Johnson, Canada. Athletics, 100 meter. Collected on Saturday, 24 September 1988. Was found to contain the metabolites of a banned substance, namely stanozolol. It's an anabolic steroid. I remember sitting in uh, the cafeteria when when someone came in and said Ben Johnson tested positive, I could not believe it. I said, oh my gosh, finally, finally. Were we suspicious? I'd say we was past suspicious. We knew what was going on in our own mind. It was one of the low times that, for me, you know, knowing Carl, seeing him. But Carl, like he always does, you know, he kind of put it aside and he began to focus on what he needed to do next after that. He didn't linger in it for very long. Johnson's disqualification meant Lewis was awarded the gold medal. He then regained his long jump title, his sixth Olympic gold. Next in his sights was his Houston teammate and protege, Joe DeLoach, in the 200 meter final. I wasn't actually favored to win, of course, Carl Lewis was. I would have favored Carl Lewis. I mean, come on, the guy was great. When that gun shot, I just forgot about everything. And I ran as hard and as fast as I could. Deloach did to Carl Lewis what Lewis had been doing to every sprinter for the previous five years. He came from behind to win. It was the only Olympic sprint final Carl Lewis would lose. He came over and he hugged me and he said, I, you know, I couldn't have uh, lost this race to a better person. And he gave us all that confidence that we needed to, to excel to really being great world-class sprinters. Deloach was one of several world-class athletes who trained with Lewis at the University of Houston and formed the Santa Monica Track Club. One of Lewis's greatest achievements was to nurture fellow athletes to become world record holders and Olympic champions. First of all, Carl's a great teammate. Once you're a friend with Carl, you're a friend for life. I mean, he was the, the Olympic uh, four-time Olympic gold medalist, and, and, and uh, I mean, he, he, he accomplished what Jesse Owens accomplished. And so we all had a lot of respect for Carl, but at the same time, we had, uh, you know, we had a model of what we needed to be as athletes right there in front of us. He was a leader, and I think what he did was he defied a lot of stereotypes that are floating out, you know, around there about, about sprinters. And I think we had a culture, you know, at that time that really deviated from the, the pomp and circumstance that people think go hand in hand with being a sprinter. And whatever Carl did, they did. And the thing about Carl, he never ever in practice tried to dominate. He was always behind or in the middle, encouraging people to do their best. He encouraged them. If it hadn't been for Carl, I don't know if uh, some of them would have made it uh, as far as they did. It was Carl Lewis's training ethic, the way he approached training. He was very serious and, and committed to it. It was very business-like for him. 